السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Welcome to the Friday حلقة and we continue uh, dealing with uh, سورة التوبة so we're still going in the series a thematic commentary on the Quran where we take uh, again we highlight the uh, the overall theme in every surah and try to see how the whole surah revolves around that central theme and makes a good case for it. Um, so we started last week with Surah at tawbah which is, uh, again we said it's the last surah to be revealed in, uh, in t as a surah, it's the last surah to, re to be revealed, uh, although there were verses revealed after it from other surahs but as a surah it was the last one to be revealed upon prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam it's surah number nine in the uh, quran we said it can easily be divided into <clears throat> three main parts uh, the first part starts from verse number one to verse number 20 um 28 and uh, the second part is from verse number 29 all the way to verse I believe number 122, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, to verse number 121, actually. And then the last part is verse number 122 uh, to, uh, to the end of the surah, verse number 129. Um, and we said the overall theme of the surah is actually quite clear in the um, in the first verse which is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distancing himself and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam from uh, or, or basically a, a complete uh, like putting an end and a dissociation from any agreement and commitment to the pagan Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula and <clears throat> this concept is carried uh, in different shapes with regards to you know other groups as well so as we will come to see to uh, when we start with uh, the second section of the surah or the second segment of the surah many issues are going to be addressed so uh, first it starts with the relationship with the people of the book people of the scripture and there is the concept of jizya here that is given and uh, according to a great deal of the Muslim scholars, the jizya is uh, is an obligation upon the people of the book who choose to live in countries that are ruled by Islam, by a government that rules by Islam. And um, um, it is a protection. It is in return for protection. So, and other services as well, but mainly the protection. So the Muslim government takes full responsibility for the protection of these non-Muslim residents, and they are treated uh, in, in terms of their safety, security, their welfare, they are treated just like Muslims are treated. They're not second-class uh, citizens at all. Uh, so they are uh, given the same level of protection, the same, um, you know, you, you can say even civil rights that are given to the Muslims in general uh, and the uh, but they do not take part in defending the country so they are they they don't have to defend the country they can just again go about their own business Muslims are obligated to defend uh, their 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 country <clears throat> then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addresses takes this to the background uh, or take us to the background of why this relationship is there, why we dissociate from uh, religiously from the people of the book, and that's because they made statements about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala claiming that Allah has a son or Allah has a partner, and so on and so forth. And uh, also elevating their priests, their rabbis, their leaders, their religious leaders and clergy to the level of obedience that is only suitable and befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which they actually like take everything they say of they say this is good they just take that uh, they take their word for it uh, without reference to <clears throat> to this scripture um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with all of this falsehood that has been 
that has entered into their religion uh, the, the 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 goal behind that was to extinguish the light of Allah but the light of Allah and the, his guidance will be there even if the disbelievers hate it and don't like it then Allah SWT exposes a very important thing and this is something that we Muslims as, which as well should learn from Allah says in verse number 34 Ya ahbari ruhbani amwal bilbatil wa yasudduna an sabilillah O you who believe, indeed many among the rabbis, the priests, uh, the clergy, they actually uh, consume and they take the money of the population, of the people, of, the con of their congregations, without uh, any just cause, without right. So they abuse their position, they ab abuse their power uh, and their status, uh, they abuse it without um uh, without without any just cause without any um uh, again uh, stipulation in religion for something like this so this is an abuse of their position and of people's love for the religion uh, and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and those who hoard gold and silver and do not spend it in the ways um that Allah specified in the path of Allah and these people will have severe punishment on the day of judgment these metals will be heated and then these people would be tortured with that with the, with, the, with these heated uh, metals the gold and the silver uh, and this shows that money generally speaking uh, money is a resource and the way Islam looks at money and wealth is that yes you have it's it's a it's a gift given from Allah subhanahu wa it's a trust given to you and you are not supposed to hoard it and make it useless. On the contrary, you are supposed to use it uh, and do something beneficial with it. So hoarding is actually uh, something that is serious in Islam, especially if this money, you, if you add to this, that you have taken this money from a non-halal, impermissible source, just like abusing your, again, your position, uh, the fact that you are clergy. And this is something we Muslims have to be aware of because Unfortunately, there are examples of Muslims falling into the same mistake that we have some, uh, you know, so-called imams, students of knowledge, scholars, people in some kind of religious position. Although in Islam, we don't have clergy. We don't have intermediaries between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we have teachers. We have people who educate and people who might lead services like congregational prayer. But not these people don't stand between you and Allah. Their role is facilitation there. Facilitation in terms of knowledge, sharing information, or holding congregational prayer. Um, so Muslims, we have to be aware not to fall into something like that. And a lot of the mistakes of the people of the scripture that are exposed in the Quran are actually meant as, uh, as, an, as, as a piece of advice that we are supposed to take... Um, seriously and not fall into the same mistakes uh, and 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 this is a serious issue these days because now uh, with the with what we have in the world today uh, you know uh, the kind of organization and the archiving and uh, so religious organizations or even mosques have to register as non-profit organization etc so there has to be a hierarchy there has to be uh, positions and full-time jobs and stuff like this so what this leads to is um, that these organizational positions and these roles and jobs could actually be confused with a religious position and uh, so and people have the tendency to respect you know those who teach them the religion those who connect them to allah or at least who are supposed to connect them to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so it, it, this means that people in these positions have to be extra cautious and have to be very i would say self critical and careful not to abuse this power and this trust from the people and not to abuse as well, you know, donations, money that falls in their hands. Uh, they're supposed to be extra vigilant and, and careful because Allah is going to ask them about these things. Then Allah 
uh, tends to address some of the wrong practices of the people, or the pagan Arabs, as how they used to avoid or evade the sacred months where, um, where warfare was haram, was not permissible. And how they used to play around with their religion and again their religion was supposed was meant to be the religion of ibrahim but obviously ibrahim salam, but with a lot of changes especially to the core of it and the essence of it which is the worship of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone then allah addresses the uh, muslims with the concept of warfare again warfare is has a place in islamic legislation uh, because it's part of the complexity of life and had Islam not legislated for warfare, it would be deficient and it would leave a gap because in the human experience, the human condition, there will be warfare. There's no time in human history where there was no warfare. So without the guidance, this warfare aspect could actually fall into chaos and uh, violate the principles of Islam. So Islam legislated for warfare and uh, it placed you know the concept of warfare there for a noble purpose and that's to protect the truth to protect lives protect justice and uh, stab and give people their rights again not as you know as as, a, as an act of oppression or an act of forcing people into islam this is all alien to islam it's not it's not something you don't find this in the quran or the sunnah of the prophet and anything that seems to be coming from these sources uh, there it's, it would be actually a misinterpretation and an inaccurate reading so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers that uh, encouraging them to take this concept of warfare seriously and consider it when it's needed uh, showing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala champions the truth defends the truth and supports it uh, by means of people who are willing to sacrifice their life for justice, for the truth, and for the guidance of humanity. Uh, there is a reference here uh, to the Hijra of the Prophet ﷺ. And interestingly, this was revealed around year 9, would say, uh, after, after Hijra. And Allah SWT refers to how Abu Bakr anhu was with the Prophet ﷺ, supported him uh, prior to immigration and during their, their trip to to Medina and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the concept of warfare Allah exposes the hypocrites and again uh, this surah was revealed uh, uh, during or during and after the battle of Tabuk the expedition of Tabuk towards the end of the expedition of Tabuk and after it where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed uh, the hypocrites who did not join the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they remained in Medina and then when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, returned to Medina, they presented all sorts of you know excuses. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted their excuses, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually exposed these people. And Allah says here, verse number 45, Indeed, the ones who uh, give you excuses and seek excuses not to take not to defend again justice the truth uh, these are the ones who truly don't believe in Allah or the last day and their hearts are full of doubt and they live in in their constant state of of doubt uh, and and this is actually one of the uh, I would say outcomes and fruits of warfare being part of again uh, Islamic legislation is that when it's really needed and it becomes the only ethical position to take which is again to defend the truth to defend justice to defend oneself as well uh, that those who seek to avoid it and run away from it it actually exposes the reality of their hearts and that's basically this life is the most has become the most important thing for them and they don't have real belief in Allah or trust in Allah or any hope in the hereafter and this is why they don't see it as a worthy sacrifice they don't see that th this life is a worthy sacrifice of you know concept they don't, concepts they don't believe in and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks here in, in detail about 
some of the practices and some of the responses of the the hypocrites Allah exposes them and Allah shows that they actually how their hatred for the Muslims really shows and transpires that they they actually they rejoice when uh, a calamity or a hardship hits the Muslims hits the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims uh, and um, when there is uh, some kind of a victory or benefit or a gain that the Muslims get they wish that they are that they were with the Muslims taking part in a battle which they opted out had opted out uh, from uh, there's beautiful concepts where Iman shows here and faith shows among the believers and Allah subhanahu wa instructs the believers here to say verse number 51 verse number 52 very beautiful and they show tawakkul the concept of tawakkul is clear here uh, Allah says قُلْ اللَّهُ say nothing will befall us nothing will come to us except what Allah wrote for us in the Qadr this is trust, this is comfort and peace in the fact that Allah wrote our Qadr and that Allah is our Rabb and He takes care of our affairs. So whatever happens, it must be good for us. Huwa Mawlana, He is our Lord, He is our guardian, He is our friend, He is our protector. So again, we are carefree when it comes to that. Unlike people who don't believe, obviously they, they, they're going to lose their, they're going to lose heart and they're going to lose um, you know, their senses and their wits. When, when their life is at jeopardy. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And upon Allah, let the true believers, uh, uh, you know, rely and put their trust in Him. قُلْ هَلْ تَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَينَ وَنَحْنُ نَتَرَبَّصُ بِكُمْ أَنْ يُصِيبَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابٍ مِنْ عِنْدِهِ أَوْ بِأَيْدِينَ uh, Say, what do you expect? Or what, what, like, what do you think our outcome is going to be? It's one of two, either victory, one of the two ends, either victory or paradise. Like that's what we're heading to. There's no third option. There's no third alternative for us. It's one of those two. And both of them are great. Either victory here in this life. Uh, okay. Or paradise in, in the hereafter. And it doesn't mean that when you get victory here, you don't get paradise. But basically, like what's going to, what is this? upcoming battle going to end up like either i'll be in paradise or i will you know be victorious that's it so so again with the believer there is there is no way to lose as long as you are on the side of allah there is no way to lose and this shows again the trust in allah and the real faith the real faith because faith is tested when things get really tough when 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 the going gets tough Faith is really tested because if you truly don't believe in Allah in your heart, you're going to start doubting, uh, you know, is it worth putting my life on the line? What's going to happen after that? Uh, and and then, then the comparison. So for us believers, that's what we're going to get, either paradise or victory. But for you hypocrites who opted out of the, the battle, you know, what's going to happen? You know, what, what do you expect? It's either punishment that Allah brings upon you, either from Him directly, or a punishment that Allah brings upon you through us, where He exposes you and He gives us power over you. So, he, so again, it's addressing the um, the the hypocrites and expo exposes them, and it shows their fear, their fear of death. Uh, and the, the lack of courage again, again, again because they don't have any noble cause to live for they don't have true belief in Allah that that they see it's it's it's, it's worthy of you know putting the life their life on the line uh, the verse on zakah that specifies who is eligible to zakah occurs here verse number 60 uh, no need to go into details um Yeah, more exposure of the hypocrites. Verse number 67 really exposes the hypocrites and their description. Allah says, Al-Munafiquna wal-Munafiquatu ba'duhum awliya'u ba'd ya'muruna bil-munkari wa yanhawna anil ma'rufi wa yaqbiduna aydiyahum nasullaha fanasiyahum inna al-Munafiquna humul fasiqun The hypocrites, males and females, they are from each other. They are connected to each other. Uh, they 
enjoin the evil. They call people to evil. And they prohibit people or advise people away from good. It's the opposite, right? And they don't spend from what Allah has given. They're not generous people. They don't spend generously. They forgot Allah, meaning they turned away from Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did Allah turn away from them? And when Allah turns away from you, Allah makes you blind. You don't know what's actually good for you. What you think is good for you, ends up being bad for you. And the things that you think are bad for you, and thus you avoid them, they actually, they turn out to be the good things. So these people are lost. Allah says these are the wrongdoers. Uh, and their punishment obviously will be the hellfire. It will be sufficient for them. Allah compares those to the believers. Where Verse number 71, Allah says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ the believers, males and females, they are from one another. They are. They care for one another. They protect one another. Uh, they 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 watch each other's backs, and um, so, yeah, and 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 they have this connection and this protection of one another, and they stand by one another. Ya'muruna bil ma'ruf. They enjoin the good. And they forbid the evil. They advise against evil. They establish the prayers in themselves. So they have faith. Allah mentions they have faith, belief. And Allah mentions loyalty and connection. Alliance with one another. They, they uh, watch each other, each other, each other's back. And they, they, there's a social obligation here, which is they enjoy the good. They forbid the evil. And they establish the prayer in their own, within themselves. And... The financial obligation, they spend from, them, from their money. And they obey Allah and His Messenger. And all of that is actually obedience. But again, what characterizes their life, what colors their life, the flavor of their life is obedience to Allah. Again, that comes from faith and trust in Allah SWT. Allah says, Allah. These ones, Allah will have mercy upon them. Uh, then Allah makes a reference to uh, paradise. There is an instruction to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam at verse number seventy-three. Ya yuhan Nabi yujahid al kuffara wal munafiqina wa ghulub anehim. O Messenger of Allah, strive against the uh, pagans, the Arab pagans here, and the hypocrites, and be harsh with them. And that shows that there is place for kindness and gentleness, and there is place for hardship and decisiveness, and even uh, you know, violence where it's needed, where it's an ethical choice. More exposure of the hypocrites, of their, again, uh, very nasty behaviors, especially how they make fun of people who try to spend for the sake of Allah and they have only little, so they start making fun of how little they are spending for the sake of Allah. And then Allah makes a reference here to Tabuk, where the hypocrites said, you know, it's it's the heat of the summer and are you going to travel northward? It's a long journey. You know, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the hellfire is actually, you know, hotter than what you are trying to avoid. Again, Allah exposes their, their, their way of trying to pass the buck here and get away with not joining the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by presenting false um, excuses that actually stand really stand for nothing um, yeah some rulings some praise of the believers and how they uh, devote themselves completely for the sake of Allah they're willing even to sacrifice this worldly life for the sake of Allah uh, who is exempt from warfare when it becomes an obligation uh, Yeah, more exposure, more exposure of the hypocrites and the munafiqeen, praise of the believers, especially the early Muslims among the Muhajireen and the Ansar and whoever follows their way and their path. Exposure of something that was a, a very important thing, which is the hypocrites tried to build, they actually built a masjid in Medina. And they the hypocrites built it and again for for many of the muslims there they were not known these were not known to be hypocrites 
but again the prophet they were exposed prophet allah exposed them to prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the reason they tried to build the masjid apparently it was for what it was you know we want to establish the prayer we want to pray so i want it to be a place for learning etc but in reality it was a, a gathering place for them for the hypocrites so they can attract some of the uh, you know muslims dupe them in and also to start plotting against islam again you know all their treachery and their evil you know under the guise of islam and, and the masjid and so on and so forth and that shows that a lot of the evil is not always very explicit a lot of it is just takes a disguise and pretends to be the truth pretends to be muslim and that's actually more venomous and more dangerous because it hits from within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes that and the Prophet sallam, by the way destroyed that masjid based on the instructions of Allah. Allah commanded the Prophet sallam, to destroy that masjid. And it shows there is place for diplomacy and tolerance for sometimes, but sometimes there is place there is no place for diplomacy, especially when it gets very serious like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to destroy what seemed to be a masjid. What seemed to be a masjid and again uh, you know Im imagine uh, i could imagine some of the hypocrites uh, they actually saying oh you know the prophet muhammad is destroying a masjid how come right but again it's not a masjid it's not and it was not a masjid Yeah, and finally there is a reference here to uh, to the death of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Uh, again, who was the head of the hypocrites, Za'im uh, al-Munafiqeen. When he died, and his son Abdullah was a very good companion, a companion among the best of the companions, subhanAllah. Um, and he came to Prophet Muhammad and he said, my father died, you know, so seek forgiveness for him. He knew his father was a hypocrite, but he was still hoping that maybe there was good in his father. Maybe there was some, some Iman in his father. The Prophet ﷺ actually shrouded Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul in his own cloak. And he prayed upon him and he sought istighfar, he, he sought forgiveness for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu afterwards, although Umar ibn Khattab said to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa don't, don't, don't pray upon him. Don't make istighfar. The Prophet sallallahu you know, gave, uh, how can I say, precedence to even forgiveness. Maybe this man had iman in his heart, etc. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Prophet Muhammad sallallahu afterwards. He says in verse number one, uh, 113 and it was not permissible for for the prophet and the believers to seek forgiveness for the pagans or for the these non-muslims even if they were related to them in blood relationship after it has become apparent that these are people of the help of the hellfire and this shows that again uh, seeking forgiveness seeking mercy for someone who passed away is not an easy matter uh, it's it's some kind of a uh, bearing witness for this person that there was goodness in them that they that they deserved you know the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, sometimes it pops up you know is it permissible to seek forgiveness or to say uh, you know may mercy of Allah be upon this person if they were not true believers and the thing is we don't have choice here because these are things these are religious things you ask Allah for forgiveness and mercy for someone they they they, they must be people who deserve that even the least uh, they they deserve, deserve it even in the least but the fact that you, the, the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah is not something that as a Muslim you should apply where it doesn't belong or ask Allah to apply it where it doesn't belong because again humans are given a choice uh, in this life 
to worship Allah or not. And the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah are conditional. Conditional in that you, you embrace good in this life. You embrace the truth. Because forgiveness and mercy are truth. And they only come to a place that is characterized by truth. A, a place that was uh, flavored with truth at least. And the fact that you want to put two opposites together shows that you don't appreciate and you don't value Allah's mercy and Allah's uh, forgiveness. And eventually, if someone doesn't deserve Allah's forgiveness and Allah's mercy, they're not going to get it even if you make a dua. Uh, so it's better to make a good dua. And this is called among the scholars, Al-I'tida'u fi dua or Ta'addi fi dua That you're actually transgress the limits when you make dua. Because when you make a dua, you're making a request. You're asking Allah to do something and there are limits for that. You're not supposed to transgress in making dua. You're, you are begging Allah. So in this you have to, you know, just do, you know, do what is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regards. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to the three companions who did not join the Prophet وسلم, in the expedition of Tabuk. But not out of hypocrisy, but out of procrastination. They just said, you know, tomorrow I'll get ready, tomorrow I'll get ready, tomorrow I'll get ready. Until it got to a point where it was, they couldn't, it was too late for them to join the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and the companions. And Allah shows here that how Allah forgave them. And Allah accepted their tawbah. And they did not present any false excuses. Actually, like the story of uh, Ubay, um, uh, uh, yeah, Ubay ibn Ka'b, uh, that basically when the Prophet ﷺ returned from the battle of Tabuk, or from the expedition of Tabuk, um, the Prophet ﷺ asked him, do you have any excuses? He said, no, Messenger of Allah. He said, I'm a very eloquent person and I can come up with a very good case, but I'm, I'm not going to say something that's not true. I'm just going gonna, gonna to stick to, to, to the truth. I had no excuse. And that was... That was courageous. That was really, it took a lot of courage and faith not to lie in such a, and, 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 and this is something because only the hypocrites, you know, were left behind and these three companions. So it was very difficult. It was more of a, there was a lot of stigma around that, but subhanAllah, these companions with so much courage, they faced that and they, uh, you know, remained loyal to the truth and they just said the truth no matter what. And then they went through a trial for, for about or just above 40 days of the Muslims being commanded not to communicate with them, not to deal with them at all in any way, in any shape or form. And it was very, very difficult, extremely difficult. Like psychologically, it was very painful. I, the description, there is a hadith, a long hadith, where, uh, uh, yeah, where, uh, uh, yeah, where, where, where the companions, they actually, uh, like, Ubay ibn Ka'b describes, Ubay ibn Ka'b describes, uh, you know, the, the pain, the emotional pain, the feeling of estrangement, the feeling of, you know, uh, as if there's no space for them. And the life became extremely difficult for them. Uh, and that was a test. That was a, a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Alhamdulillah, eventually Allah SWT revealed down that He accepted their tawbah and their repentance and and uh, forgave them. So with this we cover um, we cover the second part of the second segment of the surah and we leave the end of it for next week insha'Allah ta'ala. Although it's a small one, but um, so I was considering maybe we can actually finish, we can, we can, yeah, we can finish probably with with Surah At-Tawbah. So the last part is about instruction to the believers that although some of them should engage in warfare when it's needed, but some group of them should, uh, you know, dedicate their life for knowledge and for education and teaching. And this is verse number 122, which is a very important thing that in every nation, in every group, in every tribe, in every country, there must be enough people who are who would learn dedicate their life to learn the religion and teach people and instruct them because without knowledge and knowledge of islam you know the rest of the people will not be able to worship allah subhanahu 
uh, uh, yeah then there is direction to the importance again of war warfare where it's needed and more exposure of the hypocrites as to how they respond when Allah reveals more verses that expose them. And then we come to the end of the surah, there are two verses that some scholars believe these were the last two verses revealed to Prophet Muhammad ever. Verse number 120, uh, 127, 128, 129. لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم. There come, there has come to you a messenger from amongst yourselves that he really cares for making things easy for you and he wants to protect you from hardship and from, and from, again punishment. He's so keen uh, and he's so merciful and so, uh, so, so kind and compassionate towards you. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ If they turn away from you, O Muhammad, say Allah is sufficient for me. No one deserves to be worshipped but him. He, but him, he's the only one worshipped in truth. I put my trust in him. I rely on him. And he is the Lord of the great throne. Um, yeah, so again, so the surah concludes with connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it starts with dissociation from disbelief and the disbelievers. With this alhamdulillah we have covered Surah At-Tawbah and inshallah next Friday we will start with Surah Yunus which is a very profound Surah, very very uh, like uh, typical Meccan Surah. So inshallah uh, especially the focus on uh, the creation of Allah, the Lordship, al-Rububiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair for joining us and hope inshallah you found some benefit and some interest in like this helped de develop some interest in Surah At-Tawbah which is a very profound and beautiful Surah. Uh, and inshallah until we meet next Friday. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.